All right, good morning. We're gonna move on to the second part of the lesson. Um, so I just stopped it where I was at. And your score should save, so that's great. Um, but we're moving into the section called urban planning. And it's really exciting because we have a, um, I just upped the announcements, refreshed these announcements, but in two, three weeks, we'll have a college student who's studying urban ecology, who's really excited to talk to you all. Um, and we have a couple other guest speakers this Friday during office hours, which is at 10 a.m. Um, Becky Mann from USGS will be talking about her work remediating uranium mining in Arizona. And then next week we have a college student, um, her name is Zara, and she's studying environmental science, and she's going to do a, a talk on climate justice. So I just wanted to bring up for you, if you are interested, um, here, this is a video from calling on adults from kids to act in climate change. So um, there's a couple responses here, but you can go ahead and um, add your response there. All right, let's continue to learn. So we're in the Amazon rainforest, um, and there's human activity in conflict or tension with economic um, so conservation of the environment with economic gains. Economics then, if you refer back to your notes, being a way to look at the financial and um, living stability of society. And then conservationists who are um, mostly looking at protecting the earth. Okay, so due to the fact that the human population is increasing, we will need more housing and resources. By taking more from the environment, we will inevitably cause more damage. Politicians, scientists, and economists alike are looking for ways to sustainably provide for an increasing population. Urban planning is one of the ideas being used to protect biodiversity while also developing cities to support people. Do you know that urban planning can actually increase biodiversity? Why do you think that might be? Could it be that protected areas are designated in biodiversity hotspots? Urban planning can set aside protected areas within developed areas. Funding is set aside as part of an urban planning to domesticate existing wildlife, thus cultivating remaining organisms. That's a really interesting idea, though I don't think that's what people are doing. But imagine you had like domesticated coyotes walking around or deer. And you're like, this is just part of our city now. Non-native species are moving into urban areas where planning can help cultivate their population. Um, well, I don't necessarily know if it... Well, for a, from a conservationist standpoint, having non-native species is not super ideal, so... Um, maybe those are two of the, two of the answers you might select. And here it's mentioning national parks are a common example of urban planning. All right, so we're going to New Jersey um, to ask an expert. Here's New Jersey's protected regions. All scientific studies of social and economic impacts are valid arguments for or against political decisions. Let's explore how this might work in the state of New Jersey, where urban sprawl from New York and Philadelphia is claimed what once were urban wild, or what were once were wild lands. Click on each of the experts on the map to the right to find out what they know about protected urban areas in New Jersey. This is actually really interesting that they chose New Jersey because New Jersey is one of the first states to um, have wilderness areas. And so this is kind of the uh, initial seeding of what we designate as wilderness. This is something that I'm really passionate about especially here in Utah, we have a lot of wilderness. And I'm actually paired up with someone from New Jersey to talk to her representatives. So this is really very awesome. So let's do it. Let's visit first with Jeffrey, an urban ecologist. And this is gonna be sort of the same role as Izzy, who's gonna to talk to us in a couple of weeks. So here we have a conservationist biologist and postdoctoral research candidate, Jeffrey Brown. He first became interested in ecology and conservation biology when he watched Steve Irwin on Animal Planet. He started his career studying natural ecosystems in the wild, 
had seen the balance with metropolitan life that um, the study of forest fragments provided, he now studies urban ecology. Protected urban areas are intended to protect the wildlife that currently exists in a habitat. Which of the following would help to do that? Select all that apply. Is it that developed, develop more land because native species will always be able to adapt to urban sprawl? Um, policy has to protect other forms of pollution from ilk infiltrating that space, such as air pollution from factories and light or noise pollution from public spaces. That may be possible, yes. Um, limit noise and light pollution that may affect native species. Be true too. Extract and move resources via drilling. That seems like that would do the opposite. And make wildlife more accessible to people, encouraging their investment in it. Maybe. But yeah, also, um, if you care more about because you're able to see wildlife, you're going to care more about it. If you guys have a time where you um, saw some wildlife and that increased your interest, piqued your interest in what was going on around you in the environment. Here it says, protection can be ex executed at various levels depending on the funding and management resources available. There are different levels of protected areas including take zones, limited extract, oh, no take zones, limited extractions, and development zones. Okay, let's hear from Marcus, New Jersey City Council member. Looking into the monetary value of resource extraction, housing shortages, and natural resource conservation. Which of the following are reasons that Councilman Jacobson might cite against creating more urban protected regions? Okay, so he is um, trying to balance many priorities related to business, housing, and the environment. Okay, so might, what might he say against um, creating more protected regions? Oil and pipelines and drilling provide job opportunities. Definitely something to think about. Um, developing land can create low-income housing. Totally. The New Jersey governor signed a bipartisan bill the Shore Tourism and Ocean Protection from Offshore Oil and Gas Act, or STOP, Offshore Oil and Gas Act, into law on February 7th, 2020. Um, so that wouldn't be necessarily against um, creating a protected area. That sounds like it's for creative, creating a protected area. In early February of 2020, New Jersey passed bills requiring that 50% of their electricity be sourced from renewable resources by 2030 and subsidizing existing nuclear power plants. That seems like this is again a policy for the um, protecting urban regions. If you're moving towards renewable resources, um, you're maybe moving away from polluting resources. And so that would be a beneficial thing. And against building new, if you're using existing plants. So while companies can get offshore oil without docks and pipelines, the alternate of using floating oil rigs and ships is more expensive and difficult. Yeah, that's maybe true. So if you have to balance a budget, you're not going to want to maybe go with the more expensive option. And that's what... Um, the city councilman would be considering. A new pipeline was denied in January of 2020 because it violated water quality standards, but the state made its decision without prejudice. I'm quite sure what they mean by that. Um, with this last statement here, but so if you if you make a decision off of water quality standards, maybe you're disagreeing with the pipeline, you're making that decision not because you disagree, but because it violates water quality standards, something like that. Let's see how we did. All right, and that actually is in support, um, or would be cited against creating more urban uh, protected re regions. Um, and this is pretty cool. 
New Jersey passed a law prohibiting offshore oil and gas exploration, development and production in its waters. This counters the U.S. national discussions to expand offshore drilling in almost all of the country's coastal waters. That was pretty cool. All right, so now we're going to um, a financial analyst, Delila Pope. She was employed by Conservationist Foundation of New Jersey. She studies the economics of nearly 130,000 acres of New Jersey's urban protected areas. Here are some of the insights Dalila has gleaned from her research. Dahlia has gleaned. Wait. I spelled her name wrong. Oh, anyway, relocating just 2.5 percentage of the global annual military ex expenditure, or between 45 and 76 billion U.S. dollars, to protected areas annually could help provide an adequate management to those areas. The New Jersey Highlands have diverse natural communities, including forests, wetlands, rivers, and streams. Over 5.2 million people, more than half of New Jersey's households, depend on the highlands for their water supply. In your opinion, do Lalita's arguments favor creating and maintaining more protected urban areas or spending the same money for other infrastructure in New Jersey? Why? Um, and then go ahead and take a look and dissect some of these questions here. Um, why might she decide to invest this money? What benefit does it have? For example, creating forests or like creating keeping these forests, wetlands, rivers, and streams, um, what does that do for the water supply for the country? Okay, and let's go visit the senator, national level policymaker. Who is this mysterious senator? Good to know, Good, maybe an interesting thing to look up. Why might they leave the senator blank? What is true about how often this senator maybe changes positions. Okay, so I guess they're maintaining anonymity here, um, but a senator is approaching. So here it says, America has a thirst for oil. A senator from another state wishing to remain anonymous is approached with a bill looking for ways to extract resources while minimizing the environmental costs of mining or pumping. Um, and yeah, just background on senators, they're in for six years and they can get reelected. So it's anonymous here, but um, New Jersey has two senators right now, Cory Booker and Bob Menendez, um, both of whom have a history of voting for environmental policies to protect the area. But let's say he is, he is um, approached by another senator who's like, hey, can we can we drill in your state on your coast? There's oil there and we want it. I think it would be good. What would be arguments to support that resource extraction, but that would also protect the urban ecosystem? And here we're trying to see, can there be a balance for both? Could it be that aquatic life and fishing industries may struggle for up to 40 years in the wake of new offshore drilling? Um, that sounds like that would not protect the urban area, but they would just struggle. And that's very true. And the fishing industry is a lot of money, so or generates a lot of um, economic stability for the state. So wouldn't want to do that. What would be another argument for the resource extraction while protecting the urban ecosystem? Could it be that offshore drilling can be done most out of sight of large population centers? Selling the rights to deep sea oil can be lucrative for the government and provide some measure of relief to taxpayers. So that seems like that would be an argument for the resources extraction. And since it's out of sight, maybe that protects the urban ecosystem. Fracking causes extremely small earthquakes that usually does not pose a safety concern. So fracking is this idea of going deep down, fracturing the, um, the bed, seabed layer. And then as that happens, then it disrupts and allows gas to be able to be harvested. Um, and so um, if it is posing this earthquake concern and it can cause damage, that would not be a reason to do it. 
Um, but if it can, access resources that were once considered too difficult or costly to extract, maybe we would say yes. And then oil and gas pipelines are considered unsightly and must be routed. That would not be a benefit. Okay. I think those were, those were the right answers. Okay, so let's go on to the next section. It reads, who would you want to talk to? Which of the following members of the community would you want to interview for more information on urban planning in order to understand more about the cost and benefits of urban protected areas? Okay, so who else could we talk to? Um, someone who's going to know more about this might be the state water pollution researcher. Could give you research as to the consequences and, and uh, of having such a having um, disturbing the ecosystem on pollution. A global economist might give you another view. So we have these different levels of budgets, right? Different um, accounting within the economy and a global view might be another view to look at. And then a city resident could tell you about like the quality of life. What might um, be the benefit of having protected areas? What might be the, the downfall of not protecting those areas or the benefit of um, extracting? In those areas. So all three of those would give um, some more information on urban planning. Who, who else might you want to talk to in your city? Curious about that. All right, it's voting day. And the state of New Jersey has proposed a $250 million $250 million bond for the creation, maintenance, and preservation of urban wildlife sanctuaries. A vote of yes will authorize the bond issuance and commencement of work. So basically like yes and yes, you can go work um, on creating these areas. A vote of no will not authorize the bond issuance and commencement of work. It's November 5th and you are voting for the state of New Jersey on a bill to increase funding for creating more urban protected areas. Based on the description of the proposal shown at the left, how would you vote on that bond issue in light of what you learned from the four experts you interviewed? So I'll go ahead and let you answer that. Congratulations, you voted. Your, in your voice influences the changes that politicians implement. I'm curious, you guys are all teenagers, so you can't vote yet. Um, but it's interesting to start thinking as a as a person who's right around the corner from voting, what kind of policies would you vote for and who would you vote for? Okay, so I'm going to pause the lesson there. Um, the next portion of the lesson is really cool too. But um, on this fact of being able to vote, um, you can't vote yet, but there's a couple things you can do to get your voice heard. So I just want to share with you an optional assignment you could do. Um, speak up. So as a teenager, you may feel like you have, you do not have the control over decisions that are made in your life, overshadowed by adults who know more. Um, I know I've had some students say that to me. So you can't vote, but you can research and be prepared. So um, what you can do, this is actually, this is cool. Some of my students in Salt Lake, we went to the steps of the Capitol and we were rallying for, um, for some public lands to be protected and that was really cool, and that was a really awesome way for these students to use their voice um, on the stairs of the Capitol. And then we actually went into the governor's office and delivered a bunch of postcards that said, hey, look, I think we, everybody signed on to, like, this issue should um, be protected. So you can then, if you want to do this optional assignment, find a way, like, some issues, environmental, social, that you care a lot about, research them. And then, of course, there's always different viewpoints. Some might call them pros or cons or, or um, just different sides of the story. So one side and another angle. Go and research both of those. And then reflect on a way you'd like to have your voice heard. And maybe you even go out and do it. So that can be as simple as having a conversation on the dinner table or with a neighbor, writing a post on social media, or writing to your local newspaper. Um, it can also be something like this. There's lots of ways that you can sign online and show your support. So um, I'll talk more about this in the lesson, but there's the National 30 by 30, which is a 
proposition or a push to try to get 30% of our land, waters, and oceans by 2030 protected. Um, and so, for example, what you do here is you just sign your name and it gets added to a list of supporters for that, for that campaign. So different ways to get involved. I hope you do. And let me know if you do. You can share um, on the Wonderment. Okay.